It's the only wrestling podcast on earth with one two-time MLB All-Star Comeback Player of the Year, the head coach himself, Dimitri Young. What's up, D? I'm wearing a Pokey Reese shirt, my favorite teammate of all times, CincyShirt.com. You can also find a Dimitri Young shirt as well. Look at him now. He's now pandering. He's selling shirts now. He's this guy's chilling. involved. Holy shit. <laughs> wow. Impressive. Well, let's see what Lars has to sell here. It's Lars Fredrickson from the greatest punk band on earth, Rancid. What's up, buddy? Well, I'm, I was just online trying to find a Dimitri Young shirt, but they're all sold out. <laughs> the one is sold out. That's right. We have a two-time X Division champion, the man behind the man behind the man at Impact Wrestling, the creator of the Canadian Destroyer, my second, maybe third best friend, my first Canadian best friend, P.D. Williams. How is she going, eh? And we got this shirt from CollarAndElbowBrand.com, promo code WPP, Sunset Flip. Nice. Best pro wrestling move ever. Nice. Exciting. And guys, I'm excited to introduce this guest because I've been pushing PD to get Brian Myers on the podcast for easily a year now. I'm a huge fan of his. I love his podcast. I love everything this guy does. I am a mark for him. Is I'm, I don't even want to use that word in bad connotation because I think us fans need to take it back. But Brian Myers, welcome to the podcast. What's up, guys? Thanks for having me. And I, I don't want to steal everyone's uh, thunder here, but I think I have the best shirt going right now. This vintage... <laughs> TNA wrestling, big pop a pump. <laughs> the sleeves had to go, but it's still yeah. Good. I mean, you know, yeah, you his, his arms are bigger than your legs. You know, like <laughs> says stuff like that. Whatever. Yeah, there you go. P- PD knows a little bit about big pop a pump, so I figured I'd wear this today. What's Love up, guys? Thanks for having me. Wow. So let let I'll, I'm going to lead off, guys, because being a nerd for Brian Myers and uh, consume everything he does in a in a fan way, I just, I want to, I kind of want to know when you left uh, the big company up North came down. And at the time when you left, it was very hard for wrestlers a a lot of times to rebound, create their own identity and be successful. I think you were kind of one of the first in that trend to really step up and create your own identity after leaving the entertainment. It was it hard for you. Was it something you were scared that, that, you know, the people before you was not very successful a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, well, it depends on which firing you're talking about. Um, <laughs> Cause I'm a two time offender of that <laughs> these days. But so the first time, like it was, you know, cause I didn't have anything else to fall back on. Like all my eggs are in the WWE basket. They let you go and it's like, okay. But then my goals were very different. My goal was to get back there. You know, and I worked my ass off. I uh, literally worked, you know, multiple times a weekend, every weekend, independent wrestler and got to get that like out of my system. It's something I always wanted to do anyway, because I was uh, fortunate enough to be signed by WWE at the age of 20. So uh, I kind of lived like another dream that way and set the goal to get back there. And it worked. And I did. And, you know, had another great run. And then this time I was uh, shocked by the firing. But the big difference is with the major wrestling figure podcast, I had something uh, to fall back on, if you will, which really, if you look at it, I was falling back on WWE. The major wrestling figure podcast was like my be all end all, which is pretty cool, you know? So I don't have to, I'm still, I don't want to use it in a bad way, but I don't have to like hustle as hard as I did. Like I don't have to like, you know, do signings at the flea market, you know, just to get the payday and get by, you know, I can kind of pick and choose and between, you know, impact and the major wrestling figure podcast, I got a lot on my plate. So um, it's just very different. And my, my goal like going back there right now is like the furthest thing from my mind, you know, it's not my goal anymore. Um, Cause now all my eggs are in this, this, this basket of this life I'm living now, you know, and and whatever went on there and I'm not there anymore with the third party stuff and anything. uh, It wouldn't have worked out anyway. So it was all just like a big blessing in disguise. I'm pretty uh, grateful for it all. And don't forget you could catch Petey Williams at the Taylor free market this weekend, sending autographs. There you go. The 24th. Um, So Brian, (laughs) Uh, going back to WWE, so like I really like that that losing streak. I mean, I think it was up to like two sixty nine or whatever. And I mean, that's the, final the payoff, the something like that, right? Yeah. Okay. Two hundred sixty nine losses in a row. Yeah. yeah. Shoot, not cave it. Like shoot, two hundred sixty nine. Uh, it gets a little kabuki ish at the end there, <laughs> but, but it's pretty close. What I what I liked about that is the everybody knows what the payoff is at the end. You win. 
right? And it's like a match. Like people win matches all the time, but when you win, it's going to be like, since it was built build up for so long, it's going to be like, you just won. Well, you did win WrestleMania, but like, you know, like the, the biggest match ever and all that kind of stuff. So was that like your idea? It was like, Hey man, they're, they're not going to use me. I'm just going to pitch this. Or did they come to you and be like, Hey man, we're going to do this losing streak thing. Yeah. It was more of the first part is my idea. Like they just had no plans for me whatsoever. Yeah. And so, what really happened was somebody made like a, dirt sheet article I'm, i always when people ask me this i'm sorry i don't remember who it was or what company or whatever and it was going around like kurt hawkins loses 100th match in a row and fans were like tweeting it to me kind of like trolling me and i was like not upset by it at all because and i was just thinking like wow that's that's definitely true because like, i haven't won <laughs> you know so but i was like there's something to this though so then i kind of just would play up to it online and then by the next time they wanted me to actually win a match it was like it, it, it was like everyone in the company knew about it but Vince. And they came out, and we were, I'll never forget, we were in Barclays in Brooklyn. And this writer came out, and uh, he's like, Today's the day you're going to beat Heath Slater on main event. And I was like, Can I not? He's like, What? Like, I'd rather ride this out. Like, it's kind of like interesting. I'd rather be the guy that loses all the time than the anonymous whatever guy. Mm-hmm. And the writer obviously was real nervous about, like, I don't think talent petitions to lose very often. You know, it was a very strange situation. And I said, Let me ask you one thing. I said, Everyone in this company knows about my losing streak, except Vince. Is that safe to say? He goes, yeah. I said, then can you just tell him? And then luckily and thankfully, this guy went in and told Vince, like, hey, like, he wants to see, you know, ride this losing streak out. Can we do that? And Vince was cool enough to say, yeah. And then, I mean, at that point, I think, you know, the article was 100, and then I was creeping to, like, 150. And I thought that would be, like, enough to be like, wow, that's pretty impressive. I didn't realize it would go on for basically years. But uh, it wound up being so much fun. And, it, like, it kind of – um authentically turned me into a baby face because people would come to like the live events or whatever and like cheer me on. It was such a cool thing that, um, I don't know, somehow I saw the silver lining in it where, you know, most of the time in wrestling people kind of, I say they boo-boo face about winning and losing. And it was cool. Like I took the politics out of pro wrestling, which is nearly impossible. Like I was showing up knowing I was losing. I wasn't showing up TV going, oh, is this the day I'm going to get a big push or win a belt or like, I just never thought that ever because I was the guy that lost all the time. So it was awesome. It was like, Hey, what's your finish? I'm going to take it the best I possibly can and make it look awesome. You know, it was really, really so much fun. Um, so it was, it was just, it was a great run. Like I know people look at it like, wow, you lost that much, but it was like, but this is a predetermined sport and it's entertainment <laughs> yeah. and people really got into it and like remembered me or discovered me through it. So it was just a great time in my career. Well, I'm going to go far, far in the left field with this one. This is a baseball question. Obviously yeah. you're, you know, you have your name, and it's in um, the New York Mets colors. Um, yep. am, am, am I assuming that you're a New York Mets fan? Because I can, I'm uh, a New York, because I grew up a New York Mets fan. So I'm hoping and praying that you are one. Yes, diehard New York Mets fan. If I can scroll here, this whole wall behind me is like a Met shrine, actually. But I don't want to mess up all the setup and lose the sound. Yeah, diehard Mets fan. Uh, all throughout growing up, my, my dad was his kid, and he, I kind of inherited that. Uh, it's a tough road being a Mets fan, as you know. <laughs> Not always oh, that yeah. easy. Not always oh. that easy, but it's fun. And uh, when they do win, you know, it makes it worthwhile kind of thing. But a uh, diehard baseball fan, I actually just went to uh, Miller Park on Sunday for the first time, which is now first family field or something. I was very disappointed. Oh, gee. So who was your who was your favorite player growing up as a Met? I, I love Doc Gooden and Daryl Strawberry. So I was, a, I was a big fan growing up. I lived in uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia during – when I was like 10, 11, and awesome. that's when I became a Met fan. So uh, it's funny, Doc lives in my hometown now in Long Island, and he gets we have the same barber. So uh, I keep trying to run into him. <laughs> I, really love, I would love to see him and get a picture. But uh, so Mike Piazza was my guy. And then I was a Mets fan and a big Mike Piazza fan because I just thought he was the coolest, man. He was like a pro wrestler playing baseball, you know, the mustache and the hair and stuff. I was like, this guy rules. And he was my favorite player. And then he got traded to the Mets. And it was like this like epic moment in my childhood. Like this was like you know, <laughs> meant to be, you know. So he all in, he's my favorite. Um, I have some funny, usually when I tell people this, they're like, what? My other my tied for second favorites of all time are Turk Wendell. 
Yeah, he was a weirdo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's become a, a good friend. I, I, I met him when I threw out the first pitch, and uh, we exchanged numbers, and we keep in touch all the time. So Turk Wendell's my guy. And uh, Joe McEwing, because I just loved how hard he played. Oh, uh, yeah. We we yeah. came up in the Cardinal organization together. You awesome, know, yeah. super, 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 super Joe. Joe. Yeah, Super yeah. Joe. So I just loved the way he played so hard, looking for – it's almost like – the same, like I saw the pro wrestling side of it, you know, looking for any opportunity anywhere, any position, always hustling. Uh, I love that. So I always love that about him. Yeah, he was a great teammate. Awesome. It's it, it's interesting that Mike Piazza was your favorite player because wasn't he drafted like 260th or something like that? Second round and it's like almost like 500th overall or something crazy. Yeah. And uh, it was really, if you know the backstory, it was like a favor to Tommy Lasorda, who was a family friend. So for him to like, make it through much less become a you know a hall of famer is insane yeah well it's 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 interesting how the the irony between your career and his in a lot of ways because you had this losing streak was like this like reverse goldberg thing which i think that yours was way more believable because i think goldberg won one match and then he was up to 100. oh yeah if anyone was going into that one he'd be like wait how many matches did he have in a week <laughs> it's only seven days in a week here goldberg yeah i think he had 99 from thursday to thursday yeah um so like what you were talking about, you have your podcast now and, and you know, you're doing something more, uh, you know, it's like a, almost like a new chapter for you. Do you find it uh, way more enjoyable now than, I mean, I know you were kind of working for a goal. You got back to the WWE, all those things. Here you are, you have, you're kind of the master of your own destiny. Would you say that you're happier now than you were then looking back? And yes, I understand it's probably two totally different oh. times in your life, but are you more comfortable? Yeah, I feel like accomplished with, my WWE run and you know now I'm happier than I've ever been in my life you know I'm, I'm my own boss my, Matt Cardona and I have the podcast um it was his idea and I said yeah that sounds like fun and it just and we the crazy thing is we brought it to WWE and said hey like we know up up down down makes this company a lot of money this is the exact same concept video games toys same thing and they just it fell on deaf ears to multiple times so they basically said stop bringing it up and we said, okay, we'll just do it on our own. And it was like unbelievable. But, and even that towards the tail end there, like it's become my passion so much. Like I, I could go and have some mindless match for six minutes on main event, but like Matt and I would always be able to leave and go escape and, you know, dive deep into this podcast, which I think the thing that draws people to the show is that it's, it, it reminds, and what I love about it, it reminds you of why you fell in love wrestling in the first place. You know, those first, first sentimental feelings of when you were a kid and discovered this in the first place. So you're always kind of like refreshing your love of pro wrestling, which which feels great to, you know, you know, just turned 36, you know. So it's not, and you know, when you're involved in the business, it becomes a lot more jaded and, you know, so it's hard to keep reminding yourself of that. But the, the podcast is such a fun, creative outlet that reminds you of like, why you got involved in this insane business in the first place. So to answer the question, yeah, I mean, it's, it's been such a blessing and it's been so fun and, uh, and and we're our, we're our own bosses, you know. We're doing live shows and writing them, and like we're we we control everything. It's it's been such a blast. I'm gonna use my question to set up a Lars and Brian thing because Lars, I know you're a toy collector, and Brian, of course, your podcast. But Lars, what is your holy grail wrestling figure that you own? Because this, I kind of want to geek out and watch you guys talking. What do you think a PD Williams TNA action figure would sell for? Oh, actually, he's got an awesome that that toy business. Great figure. Marvel toys. I'm an Avenger, pretty much. I mean, yeah, it's it's made the same way as those uh Marvel figures from that that time period. So it is kind of cool. Kind of kind of fits in that world. A hockey hockey stick flag, the jersey. You can't. Yeah, that. man. I was and that was second set too. I was I was shocked when they were like, "I'm gonna be I'm gonna be in the first eight action figures of." I think of you're series Canada four. History. I don't I don't knock you down a peg, but you're, you're series four. What? Well, hold on, time but you're with big kev so that's cool <laughs> and, hey, what happens with this let me ask you since you guys are, are big into the collecting so one time i'm doing a show in like green bay wisconsin right and a dude asked me hey can you sign my action figure it's it's in the package still mm -hmm. and then i said sure and he's like oh well check this out and he turned it over but it was the back like the the you know yeah yeah it, it was it was nash it was kevin nash okay so it's an error error packaging yeah so that, i mean that's probably worth like more than a, a regular and sometimes people not really i know i don't know why that's like a misconception that people would want that so that's what i didn't know the only thing we, i know cursing on this because at the end of the day that's a that's a fuck up yeah okay well i <laughs> <laughs> well i want to know i'm like well he got the royalties for it because they probably scanned it right in the back mm. the barcode 
That but does he owe me like two bucks or what? Yeah, that might okay. be possible. Like, right. I, I just want to know if, if Kevin yeah. owes me two bucks. Right. But you should be paid what you get paid. That's the funny, funny misconception about wrestling figures or whatever. Like uh, I remember when I was, when I first got called up, the Shane twins, they were the Gemini. They had a two pack that, that their TV run was like non existent. So this two pack comes out and it's on the shelves and no one knows who they are and it just sat there. And I remember someone saying to me in the locker room, oh, like, they're not going to get paid for that. I'm like, no, that's not how it works. Like, Walmart's already bought those. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. Like, yeah, like, it's, it's Walmart's problem now, not the Shane Twins. They, they, they're walking away rich. Yeah. We're getting back to Dennis's question. Lars? I'd pay two bucks for your figure, bro. <laughs> no. <laughs> no it's, I, I would say it's like a $40, $50 figure. I'm in, a, in the package right now because those Ooh, are just getting older and older. And just like anything we've realized with wrestling, for sure, it's it's coming back around where it's sentimental you know what i mean it's almost a 20 year old figure so uh yeah trust me like that will that'll, that'll cause a spike in it i'm sure you're probably too uh, you've seen it too brian just like with the pandemic like these some of these figures just went crazy and i think it's because of that nostalgia it's like with totally. records or anything else it's like people just want that tangible item and i think that's kind of like what the, what uh the culture is, is sort of uh supporting right now it's like something tangible that you have in your hands it's no longer like you know reading a book on your computer i think there's people out there that want the physical book or, oh, or big time so w when the pandemic hit i mean matt and i got we got fired and we're looking at each other like oh no our podcast is gonna die like people are not gonna have money to you know invest in our stuff as extracurricular you know it's like oh no but it was like the complete opposite it like exploded it because people were just sitting home it all this time to themselves and they're feeling sentimental and looking for something to make them feel good and like that leads you down the road of you know childhood memories and your toys that you had and it, it like it did the complete opposite which is thank god you know <laughs> but uh it's also made the you know the uh, secondary market value of these action figures like unreal you know unreal so and it just keeps going up Right. Well, I want to know just because, you know, I, I'm ignorant to, you know, I, I'm not a collector. OK, mm -hmm. but when, when people ask me, OK, hey, can you sign this? Right. Mm -hmm. So a hey, two part question um, with the signature, does that add value for, for, you know, the action figure or whatever? And number two, is it better to sign it right on the plastic part or is it like on the top? You, you know what I'm talking about? Like the cardboard yeah. part? Uh, so autograph figures are be have really become like a thing. Uh, definitely valuable, increases the value of something. Uh, the answer to that would be like, I don't know if you know these old school, like Hasbro guys that are next to me here, yeah. their bubble are form fitting to the figure. You wouldn't sign that. That yeah, looks okay. like garbage. If it's a big flat surface, like your action figure, boom, right there, right over it. Looks good. Paint pen. That's a big thing too. a paint pen. Sharpies like don't last. I had this thing in my garage gym. I have, um, all my buddies in the business. I have them sign figures for me and I had this giant wall of them in my my garage gym and some of them are like from when I first started and they have like some awesome like sentimental uh touching things that my friends have wrote about me and to me on these figures but they're in sharpies and like these things aren't sitting in the sunlight but they just over time just fade and it's like it's so sad so uh we we pitched the paint pen to everybody because the paint pen like is gonna you know it takes time to dry but once it's there it's it's gonna look better the colors will pop you know it's just it's a nicer presentation i want to know lars oh. is uh hey yeah. we didn't ask <laughs> lars didn't answer the question your most yeah you sure didn't. figure uh, figure <laughs> yeah well you know i mean for us well see so, so I, I also like the rings too so the the, the i have this wrestlemania one ring you mm -hmm. know what I mean? i'm sure you know what it is brian you know the, uh, the jacks one yeah they're like it's got the real canvas and stuff exactly okay yeah it's massive I, I, yeah i but see the thing about it is is with a lot of my figures i take them out of the package or as they say let them breathe right let them breathe baby yeah we're, we're we pitch that because if you love it it should be displayed in that way that you want you know it's yours you want it like who don't it's weird to me to like sit on something like this is going to be worth money one day and just like what you're not really enjoying it that way right well, it's like in the sneaker world, like they, they, you know, if you if you don't wear your sneakers, it's like, well, wear them, don't stare at them, you know, they're from mm -hmm. wearing, not staring. Totally, you know? yeah. So there's like different schools of thought when it comes to the to the wrestling figure. And I don't even know if I'm skirting this question right now, but it kind of feels like I am. I don't have a, I don't have a favorite one, but I do, you know, like, well, like Punk gave me one of his, his, uh, his figures 
It was uh, one of the uh, elites and when he had the mask, when he was doing the, the mask gimmick. That's worth a lot of money. Yeah. Was but in the package. Yeah. And he signed it for me because it was my oh, 40th birthday, you know, so a lot of money. That one. Yeah. So that but was I, a, that was one of the first Mattel exclusives and it's exclusive to Ringside Collectibles that was never in stores. Right. Was about, worth a decent amount of money. But I mean, that's it's more sentimental. But in a lot of the wrestling figures I do have, like I have with that uh, Nat uh, 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 Natalie or um, uh, oh, yeah. Nightheart's, the Nightheart's, the Jim Nightheart and 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 Nat. And Nat um, so they both signed that. I have th that. That's you know? cool. So, so it's it's like it's. I think it's you know it's not about value to me. It's about more of the of the memory. You know what I mean? You Absolutely. know, as a collector, you know, and I'm sure. You know, Brian's maybe ha had experience with this, but you you have you so much stuff goes in and out. You know, there's very few things that I that I, I kind of really really cherish. I mean, yeah. it's all really nice and it's cool to have, but you know, it's more about the memory for me. And I'm sure there's a story attached to a million of your figures, right? Like, oh yeah, said. I mean, my favorite wrestler of all time is Chris Candido, and he's got one action figure, and it's from ECW, and it's you could probably get it for 20, 25 bucks. You know, mint in the package. But that's probably my favorite because it means the most to me because he's my favorite wrestler. It's his only figure. You know, he wasn't like John Cena. has like 2,700 action figures. Now. This is the only one. Um, and he's the, the first guy that ever trained me. He trained me the first day that I ever got in a ring. And then the school shut down. It was one day of training. That's a whole other story. But, uh, yeah, so that, that, that one, like, means the most to me. But value-wise, it's, it's, you know, out of the package, it's like a $5 figure. You know, but that's not the point. Hey, I wanted to jump in on this because I was a card collector myself. And I cards, are, a, cards are on fire right now. Yeah, I wish I could have held on to mine for another decade. Oh, my God. Because I, I sold my card collector. I had a PSA 10 rookie cards from oh. St Stan Musial all the way up to my brother, Delman. And I had uh, Reggie Jackson. No way. PSA 10. I had Roberto Clemente PSA 10. Hank Aarons. You know, oh, no. a bunch of Hall of Famers, and uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, and I'm hearing you two talking about collecting and stuff. I just had to jump in, and I want to know if you had any um, any baseball card in your collection. I got a whole baseball card collection, um, deep into wrestling cards too. Right now, the cards are like toys and wrestling figures are are exploding. Trading cards are literally on fire. It's insane. It's insane. 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 Like you can't even. They can't keep them in stores, like in stock. Like it's so on fire, especially PSA. I don't know if you know this. Got so out of hand, they had to shut down. <laughs> they, had, they had a million something cards backlogged for people trying to send their cards, and it, it, it's trickled over to wrestling with all the Dwayne Johnson cards and stuff. They're just, they're just the prices are astronomical. So I'm, I'm knee deep into that. I have a pretty uh, decent PSA collection. Um, Mainly Mets stuff, Mets auto. I collect Mets autographs. I have like a uh, 170 Mets autographs, like pack pulled ones. Then I had ones when I was a kid that I got, like you know, reaching over to the dugout and stuff, going to games at Shea. Uh, it's like those are like you know priceless to me because I got them in person. But um, pretty wild what's going on with cards right now. Yeah, it's, I mean it's insane. Yeah. I can get you a Dimitri Young autograph if you want one. Well, you know, guy. I do <laughs> actually. Well, I have a PSA 10, my upper deck rookie. That's pretty 92. Cool. Yeah. I mean, anything PSA 10 is just, it's crazy. I mean, it's just because now you can't even get it. So it's all like you think of the, the, them shutting down would make it, you know, less valuable. It's making it even more because now you can't literally can't get a card graded for, by them for a while or until they're, they're back up and running. All right. I, I got to take this back to wrestling now because Rebellion is coming up this weekend. This interview will definitely drop before Rebellion hits. And uh, you, are in a grudge match with your podcast co-host. And, you know, I, I keep teasing PD and I should do like a fake cinematic match since I'm fat. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I have PD on the hook. I think PD's yeah. going to do it. I would say, how many cuts would you need to get a complete Canadian I, destroyer? Yeah. A lot. <laughs> like 10 cuts. <laughs> I'm going to get winded just getting there. Let's let's get that out of the way. But how hard is it since you're, you know, do the podcast with this guy, you're in a program with this guy to keep business and kayfabe, and, you know, because I guess we're in the era where some guys are trying to bring it back and hustle it. And other guys are like, nope, this is my real name. This is my persona. Yeah. Where are you following? I think that wrestling has evolved to like where we're movie stars and that's where it should be be you know what i mean you don't if you go to a movie you don't sit there and go oh this is bullshit tom cruise isn't a secret agent blah, blah blah i can't get into this like 
That's that's what wrestling is. It's the same shit. And I'm sorry, but all these old timers have done interviews like I'm doing right now, and they've exposed this for years. So if they're sad about it, then it's their fucking fault. Okay, everyone knows how it works. It's entertainment. Sit back, enjoy it for what it is. Do I hate Matt Cardona? Absolutely not. He's one of my best friends. <laughs> okay, am I thrilled that we're gonna get this opportunity on Sunday to share the ring with a guy that I've known since I was 18? You know, my best friend, my business partner, and have our you know first one-on-one match on pay-per-view. Yes, that's freaking <laughs> awesome. Uh, at Impact Wrestling, you know, the most professional wrestler, Brian Myers, is a complete scumbag piece of shit. And I hope people hate my guts for that hour that they, or two hours that they watch, uh, you know, Impact on Access TV and the pay-per-view and whatever it is. But if you're a fan of Brian Myers, you really know that, like, you know, I'm a family man and I'm a wholesome dude and I got a lot going on. And that is what it is. I play this character and that's what it is. Still <laughs> awesome. Still great. Sit back and enjoy it. I'm sorry, but to think otherwise is just kind of foolish at this point and looking at rebellion like you know i'll, I'll be there I, I hope you know they they delegate your match to me because you know i've only i've only produced one of your matches mm-hmm. and i mean and I'll, I'll, i've never said it to you personally but i'll say it publicly like you you get it man you're one of my favorites like i don't even have to say anything to you you're like it's like yep this is this and it's you just you get it man you're, you're such a professional when it comes to that that the wins losses and that's why i knew you you got that storyline of the you know 269 losses like it, man this is this is a, this is show business right yeah. um but you know my question is so you get released by by wwe right so how did that next step go when you came to impact was it like you know scott or whoever reached out to you did you reach out to them was it was there other interests you know from other companies trying to reach out to you thanks uh, well first off thanks for saying that um yeah so we got let go and i admit i think we were all shocked that day because we were like what is a pandemic what is this what's going on and then wwe was like oh we don't know either but see you guys you know yeah. it was like kind of like really heartless to this day i'm kind of like how did you have your most profitable year of all time and then you know do what you did very strange but i don't care anymore um but within like the week i want to say tommy dreamer called me it was just you know basically like my pro wrestling dad. He's always looked after me, hired me in the first place in WWE, you know, many, many years ago. And uh, he gave me the impact pitch. And I, I just had just signed a five-year contract with WWE. So I had like, you know, no thoughts of like going elsewhere, you know, big fan of AEW and I watch it and support it. And a lot of my students work there and I think it's great for the business, obviously. And I just hadn't even crossed my mind about working anywhere but WWE. So it was all new to me. Uh, so Tommy, you know, put impact in my mind almost right away. And then I actually worked with Scott a decent amount, uh, for the short lived global force wrestling, yep, yep, I uh, run I had a couple of years ago. So I had a prior relationship with him and I knew he was a cool guy and whatever. So that, that's how it got rolling. And then I'm certainly glad that it did. I feel like it's a perfect fit. They've given me more opportunity than I've ever gotten. And just, you know, matches alone, which I, I'm always pretty confident bell to bell what I can do, but they're giving me the opportunity to talk like consistently for the first time in my career, which I really appreciate because I've always, always wanted to do that. And uh, being a husband and a father of two at Impact, the best part is I only work three days a month yeah. <laughs> or less sometimes. <laughs> I mean, the three days we work are long and hard and you basically don't sleep and sometimes wrestle multiple times a day and you have an insane amount of pre-tapes and things. But, you know, we work hard in those three days. But then you get to enjoy, you know, that time off. And um, I've been home with my family and it's been incredible getting to be a dad and, you know, not, you know, being on the road, you know, four and a half days a week like I was. So that's another incredible perk of the, of, of it all. So I'm just so glad it all worked out because I, I really, really do enjoy it. And that's not like a, you know, brown nose and cheap plug or anything. It's just, it's just been a great experience for me. I finally have a wrestling question for you. Oh, baby. Yes, because... Um, I just wondered, um, because I always wondered about guys that have been in the WWE and then they go elsewhere. Is that like a blessing or a curse, you know, going in because are people looking at you like you're coming to take my job or or like the younger people come up to you like you're the Wiley veteran who knows how to do stuff. And like you was talking about with PD being able to have that freedom to be able to speak, whereas you had a script to go on and stuff. So. I just want to know that transition and how you are a mentor to those. Yeah, it's a, I think it's a mixed bag of both. You know, obviously wrestling is very competitive and there's politics and people, you know, I'm sure, you know, last year's Slammiversary when whatever, you know, seven ex WWE guys show up on one night, I'm sure the Impact roster was 
thrilled, but uh, on another hand, kind of like, oh shit, you know. Um, but I think it's all worked out for the best. To me, it's just like, you know, we're all very blessed to be doing this. It's such a unique way to make a living. And, you know, just, you gotta, like, at the end of the day, you know, just have fun with it. You know, a, a bad day of wrestling to me is better than, you know, a good day at some some desk job that I never wanted. So uh, I think it's all about your, your attitude, you know, to be, you know, not taking yourself too seriously, kind of like what PD said, you know, not, you know, uh, bitching and moaning about everything. And then the other adjustments are that, you know, there's life outside of WWE, and, but everything's different. You just got to be open-minded. You know, I remember the first day we were getting ready to go and we were down at the hotel gym and uh, I was explaining to Heath Slater, who basically has only ever wrestled in WWE. I'm like, dude, there's probably not even wrist tape and baby oil in Impact. He's like, what? No wrist tape and baby oil? Like, you know, you just got to realize <laughs> that like, you know, wrestling is different everywhere. But at the end of the day, it's still pro wrestling, whether it's, you know, at WrestleMania in front of, you know, 80,000 people or it's at a VFW in front of 35 people. It's still pro wrestling, you know what I mean? So just go out there and do what you do to the best you can and enjoy yourself. If you can, if you can have that mindset, you can, you can be happy anywhere. You know, you know when, when we have guys that are sent from the big leagues down to the minor leagues and they're disgruntled about being sent down, we call it, having big league itis. Oh, that's so tough though, yeah. Yeah, it is, but, uh, and and what, what guys do, the ones that are very good at what they do, they come down and they like, they'll tell the guy that gets sent down, hey, you're here to work on something. Let's remember, you're here to play baseball. And then they find a the love for the game again. I went through that when, um, when I was with the Cardinals back in 97, um, the Cardinals traded for this big tall redhead dude that could hit 70 homers. And I had an option, so I, when I got sent, <laughs> so when I got your spot, man. Oh <laughs> uh, no, it was his spot. I was keeping warm, <laughs> <laughs> and so when I got sent down, I was back with the guys in the minor leagues that I got that I got called up with, and they were down there, and it was just like I was back in heaven. I fell in love with the game, got called yeah. back up, and then ultimately got traded to the Reds, and my baseball career really began from there. So mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure for guys that that lose that you know that contract with wwe the younger guys anyway you have your shit together but i'm talking about the guys that are younger where it's like it's gone and guys like you basically what i'm saying is the big league guy thing and the attitude like you was talking about you got to have a good attitude yeah i think i in my especially my first run in wwe i saw so many guys get fired and then their careers just kind of didn't go anywhere and what i thought I saw coming out of all that was the same thing just guys just that woe was me sitting home feeling sorry for themselves and it's like nah man after that you got to hit the ground run and you know become your own man be take care of, you know be your own business basically is what you you have to become and uh sitting around feeling sorry for yourself like nothing's going to get done doing that you know I think I just always had that in the back of my mind you know I and throughout uh the history of professional wrestling we've seen so many different kinds of matches I think Petey, didn't you do like a Canadian bull rope match or something like that? Uh, so, yeah, I probably. I did yeah, a reverse yeah. battle royal match. Like, come on. Man. Like, right. And then you got like your, you know, tables, ladders, and chairs. You got this. But, you know, here you are. You're wrestling your best friend. How come it's not a fucking favorite figure versus favorite figure <laughs> match? I mean, you have a golden opportunity here. <laughs> you need management. I'm the man to call. Why yeah. isn't it that ma a match? It's probably because if I hit him over the head with an LJ and King Kong Bundy, I'd kill him. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, right? It's too dangerous. Step on a Lego in the middle of the night, that hurts like hell. Step on a, you know, a Scott Hall figure doing the two sweet hands, that's going to hurt like hell. Uh, Probably something like that. We we tried to incorporate figures last month at uh, Hardcore Justice and kind of missed. I don't know if BD saw that. Yeah, I saw that. <laughs> but I was supposed to get hit over the head with this bin of all these loose action figures. And it, that part worked, but the figures went flying the wrong way. And then when I yeah. came back, I was supposed to take like a black hole slam, like a tack bump, but there was no figures to really get bumped on. And the reason why we couldn't, like, you guys were both blindfolded. Yes. So it's not <laughs> like he didn't, like, he couldn't see if they were there. It's like, okay, I'm hoping they're there. And yeah, but whatever. <laughs> it happened. Very, uh, very difficult task, the uh, blindfold hardcore match. First ever and probably last ever in pro wrestling history, but that was me. <laughs> I liked it. I loved it. Holy smokes. When when the Robert called me about that, I was like, what? <laughs> the whole point of Blindfold Match is fan participation with the pointing. There's no fans. I <laughs> yeah, right. this. Is he over here? Is he over here? Yeah, there's, there's no help. It's impossible. <laughs> Marco Polo match at that point. Literally, like an impossible <laughs> task. 
Are, oh. are you having fun again in wrestling? Oh yeah. If I'm not having fun, then I'm. I'll just whatever. I'm gonna work at Target. I'm done. You know, I don't want to. But the whole point is that, like I said, we're so blessed to be doing this. Like pretend fighting with your friends in spandex for money. That's what we're doing at the end of the day, right? So if this is not if you're not having fun. What's the point? You can do anything for money. You know, we'll go do anything. Mindless work. But this is this. I'm passionate about it. I'm having fun. Like I said, Impact's is such a blessing to let me be home. You know, most successful pro wrestlers are on the road, you know, five days a week. And I, I don't even have that going for me right now. So it, it's just, everything is great. All right. I want to take it to, uh, so you said uh, a lot of your students uh, are working for AEW and stuff. We had one of your students on here, uh, you know, probably last month or something, MJF. Oh, right? sorry, guys, sorry to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> he stays in, you know, character the entire time, does a great job at it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, you trained him. All right. Yes. Okay. So tell me about like when you first met this dude, did you think, oh, this guy's going to be something or, or nothing? Did, did you know he had the potential that, you know, he had? Yes, up adding? right away, right away. He came into my school. He's, I don't know if he told you the whole story, but he basically he was supposed to be a college football player, scholarship and everything. And he like escaped in the middle of the night and just came home, drove all the way home and told his parents, that, no, I don't want to do this. I want to be a pro wrestler. And his dad was like, what the fuck? So his dad just like <laughs> brought him into my school and was like, he's your problem now he needs to be a wrestler because i'm fucking pissed basically <laughs> and uh but like you know obviously he's passionate enough to make that decision and then you know the work ethic the passion the, the charisma it was all there i basically just showed him how to you know grab the wrist locks and stuff like he he had that gift of the gab and all that from day one and, and the work ethic you know i mean he was always there for almost you know first one there last one to leave type of situation so it, it was not much doubt and, and we had like even when he was young and quiet at first, you know, the first couple of months, like we had a, promo, a couple of promo days where I was like, oh, okay. And I could tell right away. Yeah. I, I mean, uh, like obviously the character that he plays, you know, it does it very well, but I don't want to ruin it for him, but you know, off camera, like he's, he's a pretty humble dude, man. Very yeah, respectful yeah. and all that kind of yeah. stuff. So, but it is, there is MJF inside of him. It's just, you know, it's that old pro wrestling volume turned way up type scenario. And that's for sure. You know, that's why it works so well. Dimitri? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I was um, wondering um, when a guy comes into WWE to learn the WWE style, is that like a real style or uh, does it translate into the indies or other, you know, wrestling organizations? I think the biggest difference is um, working for cameras, you know, taking the time, you know, to tell a story with your, a facial expression or, you know, I used to hate when I was younger than these veterans. I remember Al Snow would tell us all the time, no VW, less is more, guys. And I'd be like, Al, shut the fuck up. And now I'm like, man, he was right, you know? <laughs> less is more sometimes. Like, I can do so much more from my match and my storytelling with a with a, a shot, elongated camera shot on my face and what, you know, I'm trying to portray than just doing a bunch of more moves, you know? And that, that takes a long time to really understand, especially, like I said, when you're young and you just want to do all the coolest shit you can possibly think of. It's stuff like that. It's like knowing where those cameras are, when to do those moments. And uh, I think that is what separates people from the pack. And I think that's what gets referred to as WWE style because basically WWE style is always filmed where it's important. You know, I think that's where it gets that name. But but that's important stuff. And I think that's going to really separate like, you know, good and great wrestlers. Like I said, it's at the end of the day, entertainment, you know. Well, you know, one of, one of the things I always want to ask guys who've been doing this for a long time, I mean, I don't really remember my first ever show at all. Um, but do you remember your first wrestling match? Um, you know, sometimes you see little snapshots in your head of things that you've done. But do you remember that first match? What it, you know, that feeling that you had, and who was it against? Yeah, so uh, it was a battle royal, and um, so we, I was trained by uh, ECW legend Mikey Whipwreck. So very fortunate that yeah, he he really trained me trained me gave me like the fundamentals and stuff and actually i always thank him to this day because like he really instilled in me like the basic fundamentals i think has really kept me safe throughout my career which is really important but uh also things that are like very impactful to me in wrestling i have like vivid memories of these days like it's crazy and that's one of those days i have like a deep deep vivid memory and i know the biggest thing was it was matt and i and we were getting down to like the final six or eight and this big dude named mega was going to double close on us out and we basically were like okay we have to take this you know that backwards double clothesline over the top rope and if we don't mess that up like 
they'll think we did a good job. And basically we did. We, it was a nice picture perfect flip. We're like together and in sync. We both go out and we're just like, oh, thank God. You know, and the other funny thing that I think uh, Matt still busts my balls about to this day, I kind of have like a chapstick addiction. I don't really need it, but I just am always like, I always, I have one like in every bag I own. It's always in my pocket, in my car, whatever. And I, we were in this, we characters that we were like, punk kids that would go to the club so we're wearing like button downs and like black <laughs> black pants and there's at one point i'm bumping around for all these guys and i'm laying there and i see my chapstick just like bouncing up and down the mat <laughs> as people go and i'm like oh no and i'm like crawling to get the chapstick back to put it back in my pocket because i just thought it looked like so stupid but matt always makes fun of me about that so yeah i have like a lot of vivid memories of that day but that was the biggest thing <laughs> that's funny <Yeah>. um <laughs> sorry i'm still kind of giggling over that <laughs> um I, I, I got to ask you, you were in Global Force for a handshake, and you went back to the WWE. There were a lot of ups and downs for the company while you were gone. A lot of, uh, I don't, maybe bad intel. It did not have a good reputation. So uh, the pandemic hits, you go, you're, you're a free agent. What were your misconceptions going into Impact Wrestling? Because even knowing PD being backstage, seeing a lot of this stuff, I had misconceptions as a fan. I'm sure you as an industry regular guy, you, you had in misconceptions about the company. I don't know if I had any misconceptions because I just had so many friends there, which I was grateful. Like, you know, Gals and Anderson, two of my best friends, they're going in the same time. Heat, one of my best friends in the whole world. Now Matt's there, you know, Dreamer's there to, you know, kind of have my back kind of thing. I had already known Scott, so I didn't really have any misconceptions. I think what I hate the most now is the misconception the fans have of Impact or the people that have just given up on it because of yesteryear. And it's, it's just such a different company, such a different product. And I, and anytime I do interviews like this, I, I plead with people, give it a chance. If you haven't given it a chance, it's on Twitch and Twitch is free. So like, you know, it doesn't take much to really, you know, uh, invest into it you know give it some time and you're going to see that it's so different you know that that dixie era you know no offense is so far gone and there's people i think it's a lot of it's so unique and like you said there's a lot of creative freedom you'll see you'll see these people that like you know you can tell this isn't some wwe here's your promo do it type of scenarios there's people having fun and cutting loose and being artists you know we're artists as pro wrestlers you know this is our interpretations of ourselves as these characters and it, it's it's a lot of fun and I just wish more people were open-minded to checking it out. Cause I think it just got, it just has that all oh, that's so impact kind of like bad rap from yesteryear, but like there's literally no one left except PD from that time. So, uh, <laughs> well, we have a, we have a special guest, I guess that just joined us. Uh, Jason Kendall. Good to see it. You got to press unmute on your phone. <laughs> there you go. Unmute that buddy. Yes. He, he's not good with technology, but he is boy. not. He knew. He's not good with oh my God. Complete the job, Jason. Push Jason. unmute. You got you got to press unmute. But there you go. There <laughs> oh, hey! Wow. Right. I know. Check out, check them out. I got new choppers. Oh, that yeah. looks great, dude. Brian, what's going on, man? How what's are up, you, dude? How are you, man? Fan, man, huge fan. So nice I just to I'm a big fan of you too. Now. I got oh, your I, I, I got I'm your starting lineup man. figure in my garage. Oh, you could. Yeah, well. I, I wouldn't hawk it, but no, I, wouldn't get I, have, much, I have all my uh, all my favorites lined up there in a little starting lineup collection. You're in. Very cool, man. Well, no, I'm a huge fan, and I'm uh, so happy to uh, actually be on here with you and um, just to meet you. But uh, you guys, go ahead. I'm just I'm just uh, listening real quick. I got about five minutes. <laughs> you so, don't want? Okay. Right. Well, I'll take over from here. I want to talk about uh, your wrestling school, Creative Pro. Is that yeah. is that still going on? Or oh, is yeah, that, yeah. So t tell me about that. You got like upcoming students that we should be looking so for and like basically at the tail end of my first WWE run they weren't booking me and I was like losing my mind and I hate I'm a big fan of or a big believer in like you know wrestler time off is the wrestler's worst worst enemy so I was like going to all these different schools to train and just like driving and my my days off and I was like this sucks and I basically brought it up to my buddy Pat Buck and he goes I'd open a school with you right now I said you know what screw it <laughs> so we opened a school like out of very selfish reasons uh wound up being incredible uh, being a coach, it's like weird, you know, you live through these guys and it's just something I, like I said, I opened it with very selfish intentions. So I wasn't even thinking about that. I just wanted a place for me to train. Um, but it's been so awesome. Uh, we have MJF, who everyone knows MJF now. We have Chris Statlander with Max Caster is really blowing up now in AEW. Oh, love him. We have Joe Bronson of uh, Bear Country. 
who's on AEW as well, and then a ton of other guys and people we have, I call them, you know, castaways, people from other schools have kind of migrated to us. And it's just been such a great experience, such a great community we built, you know, like it's not, it's never, it was never set up to make money. Like that wasn't my intentions, like I said. So that's the least of my worries. Like granted it does make money, but that I don't care about that. Like if you have a bad attitude, we see it, we get rid of you. And we're not just trying to cash grab you. You know, we have a very tight knit, group of people that are very passionate about the business and it's been a successful formula. You know, Pat, in that time, I mean, I got rehired. Pat works with WWE as a producer now. So, I mean, everyone there that puts in the hard work has been pretty successful. You know, guys like Eric James at VSK have been on Dark consistently. You know, they train with us. Reynolds and Silver are, they're not originally trained by us, but guys that, you know, are in our, our group. So it's, it's been just so cool. And it's so cool to like see everyone doing so well and all this hard work paying off and, you know, um, it's been great. The, the pandemic took a big hit on us because the rent at, at uh, my school is pretty substantial. And we had to shut down for a couple of months there. But we're, we're back on track now. I'm actually coaching tonight. So Awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. You, we, you talked a little bit about your love for baseball. And with Jason Kindle on, we have the original group of what the wrestling perspective was built on. Can you talk a little bit about some of the guys as, uh, you know, Kurt Hawkins you got to meet who were actually wrestling fans? Because Jason Kindle, you know, when he hit his, I believe this for the cycle, he was wearing a, was it Stone Cold or a Razor Ramon shirt under your? Uh, your... No, it was, yeah, it was a Stone Cold shirt. It's, oh, wow. So we're all major wrestling fans here. And, you know, Dimitri talks a lot about how the Cincinnati locker room was the uh, NWO black and white and the other half NWO red. That's sweet. So, so for you as a wrestler, when a baseball player comes up to you, can you out some of these guys? Would you name some names? Um, I mean, sort of. So the, the first encounter that I really had, well, first off, uh, my original schedule in WWE, it was actually all dreamers, a huge baseball guy, as well as you guys know. And he would always be like scouting, like, okay, we're off on this day. We can hit this stadium. So I, I knocked out, like, I'm trying to hit every stadium. I'm like seven or eight away. And that, I, a lot of them I banged out early with, with Dreamer because we were just, oh, it was just awesome. It's like, I know so-and-so and he'll hook it up. And we went, you know, it was just a blast. So that rule. Then um, I took my dad to Mike Piazza. They retired his number, I believe, the Mets in 2013. And I was catching a flight to go to Raw or something. It was a Sunday game. It was the last game of the year. And I was catching a flight. And then I got a tweet from Zach Wheeler that said, oh, I think Kurt Hawkins is in the airport. And I'm marking the fuck out because, like, diehard Mets fan. He's, like, this new prospect that we traded Beltron for. I was like, holy shit. So then, like, I met up with him in the airport. We exchanged numbers. And we've been buddies ever since. So that was the first time that, like, I really, like, met a baseball player and became friends with him. Uh, since then, like, I, I've kind of had a similar interaction with, like, Justin Turner when he was in Med, which, God, it kills me that – <laughs> they let him go, and he became a megastar, which, I mean, it's awesome for him, but sad for Mets fans. Uh, so those, those are the guys that, like, I got in with first um, that, that, like, let me get in the other side. I've become friends with Derek Holland, who comes by, like, anytime, anytime we are at, at doing TV anywhere near where he is, he always finds his way there, so I keep in touch with him. Uh, so that part's been cool to kind of – and like I said, Turk, Turk Wendell, this is the craziest thing – the the week of WrestleMania when we won the titles, I threw out the first pitch at City Field. And I every time I go, I've been lucky enough with WWE, I've gone a bunch of times, they'd make you that jersey. And I keep changing the number. So I've done like 31. <laughs> I've done 47 for Joe McEwing. So I did 99 for Turk Wendell. And we're down there on the field and uh one of the Met reps was like, why'd you pick 99? I said, Oh, because Turk Wendell's one of my favorites. We're gonna have to go. Oh, he's here today. He's up in the box with Mookie Wilson. You want to meet him? I was huh. like Yes, I fucking want to meet Turk. Holy shit. So like I went up and I'm like interested with Turk Wendell, like probably the biggest fanboy Turk Wendell's ever met. And uh we exchanged numbers and now we talk and stuff like on a pretty regular basis. He wants me to do uh I guess out of the pandemic when when they do it again, those fantasy camps, which I would love to do. Well, you gotta They're do fun. a fantasy camp. Yeah. You got they are I, fun. I told you with the Reds and do you, you do it with the Pirates, don't you, Jason? Uh I've done it with well, Kansas City and um Milwaukee. But they're See, fun. And I think that's why Owen, Pittsburgh uh, is bad. <laughs> I'm 0-20 as a manager, but I'm going to tell you what, I'll guarantee you my guys have the most fun. <laughs> yeah, it sounded like a blast. He was giving me the hard sell, and I'm like, it's a at, good the time, time. at the time I was in WWE, I was like, this is never going to work out. But now that 
I do whatever I can probably make it happen. Which and, you, and you can, you can probably set it up to where you get you and your boys and all be on the same, the same team. Cause yeah, yeah. I mean, you got a bunch of different, but no, it, it, it's fun. And you got to get the, uh, but if you get like some of your buddies, and the, the Mets is a good one to go to. They do it down in um, Port St. Lucie. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doug Flynn runs that one. Cause he also runs the Reds as the commissioner. Great oh, sure. guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Little, little confession, guys. So baseball is like my passion, like be all end all growing up as far as sports go. I was football, wrestling, baseball straight through. Definitely my worst sport. <laughs> I, I was the worst defender of all time. I got thrown out of a game in JV because I made seven errors at first base. That's all right. That, that happened. No. Dang, all right. I finally, oh, my God. Yeah, I made seven errors in one game at first base. Finally, on the, on the seventh one, I caught, had the ball, and I went, Jesus fucking Christ. And I slammed the ball, and the dump threw me on. I was like, thank God. The only reason I said that's all right is because – I haven't been on the show in a while, <laughs> but Dimitri's right. That sucks, dude. As big as you are, man, you just block the shit and then pick it that up. Garbage. That was just a garbage defender. I loved it. I could hit, I could strike out. I hit a home run for you. That's about it. That's hey, that's just like what baseball's baseball doing today. Today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. I was ahead of my time then, I guess. I, well, Dave, Dave, you're like the uh, the professional wrestling Dave Kingman. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I, I had launch angle before that was a thing. Wow. <laughs> Listen, hey, uh, uh, what, Dennis, I, I have a question. You jump roped over me. See, I wanted to know about you being in the Major Brothers and being an edge head. What kind of influence did, did edge have on you during the young part of your career? Uh, it, was, it was a legit thing. It was a shoot, man. Like, uh, to this day, he's like my, my, you know, wrestling mentor. Like, if I have something I'm wondering about or I'll text him and ask him or send him a match and say, hey, check this out. You know, what do you think about this? Um, I always say about that, like, we could not have been less than nobody's. Like, we were just jabrones in the locker room doing nothing and pulled him aside and pitched this idea. And he could have said, get the fuck, you know, like, and he just, he, he said, yeah, and he didn't know us. He didn't know what kind of people we were. I don't know what, what in his mind. I mean, maybe he just thought the visual of the three of us looking the same would be cool. And that was enough for him. But thank God he did because it, it changed my whole life, my career. I mean, literally, in 2008 when we did that, in my mind, he, and I think it holds up, and I'll, I'll argue anybody wants to argue it, he's the best wrestler in the whole world. Main event guy, WWE champion, and we watched him night in, night out from the best seats in the house, literally front row, ringside, seeing what it takes to be that guy, you know, traveling the world, doing it every night at that top level, putting in all that time. Um, and, and that goes through everything, his ring work, his promos. He had it all, man. So... It was just unbelievable learning experience. That it, one of a kind thing that I don't think many people in this business have ever really had the opportunity you know, to do something like that. It was pretty nuts. That's cool. Anybody have anything else? Good. All right. Well, listen, first of all, Jason, thank you for coming back home. We miss you. And congratulations on the big family news. We're super excited and proud of you, man. Awesome. But hey, more importantly, Brian, it was a pleasure to meet you, man. And we'll uh, definitely hook up at some point. Oh, yeah, man. I love that. All your other knuckleheads. Uh, We'll we'll hook up to you sometime, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, hey, you guys all be good. D, keep going, man. What's your record? We're eight and five, and we're playing a good team today. But I got a good picture going. There's gonna be a lot of scouts there. Nice. When in doubt, hit him in the neck. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all be good. Take all care. Right. Nice. Peace, Jason. For for everybody, the podcast is over. Go home. We don't want to see you until the next one. For the rest of us, we'll say our goodbyes off the air. Thank you so much, Brian, for stopping by and talking with us. You yes. you brought Jason Kindle out of retirement. Yeah, thanks, guys. You really got to twist my arm to talk wrestling and baseball. You know, I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we heard. So uh, thank you guys for watching the Wrestling Perspective, and good luck this Sunday, Brian. Thank you.